you ever experience guilt, a sense of guilt for your sin or shame over your sin, as we all do and should, you need to immediately look to this scene that I'm going to read about and describe this morning, which is the scene of the crucified Christ. This should be your only comfort that you run to and throw yourself on as you experience the guilt that comes by your sin and the shame that comes by your sin. And this should bring immediate relief to you. The life of the Christian is one that perpetually runs back to the cross and back to the cross and back to the cross so that you are over and over reminding yourself that your sin debt has been paid. Pardon's been purchased and forgiveness is yours. So even as we saw in the baptisms earlier, the identification with the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ is a proclamation to those who were baptized that their sins are forgiven. God is telling them by the waters of baptism, your sins are forgiven. And even as we participate in the Lord's Supper in a week from now, God willing, God is communicating to us through the Lord's Supper, your sins are forgiven, your sins are forgiven, your sins are forgiven. And it's all by the merits of Christ, specifically Christ on the cross. All the shame and misery and guilt that he suffers on the cross, which he did not deserve, is our shame and misery and guilt that we deserve. And he's paid for it. So we need not experience guilt over and over because of things that we've done, sins against God, but instead we cast our sins to this particular point in history and this person, our Savior, Christ. And there comes peace because of the objective work of Christ on the cross. He actually did something to remove our guilt from us and our guilt before God. So let's look at Matthew 27, verse 26. Then he, speaking of Pontius Pilate, released for them Barabbas, and having scourged Jesus, delivered him to be crucified. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the governor's headquarters, and they gathered the whole battalion before him. And they stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him. And twisting together a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and put a reed in his right hand. And kneeling before him, they mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. And they spit on him and took the reed and struck him on the head. And when they had mocked him, they stripped him of the robe and put his own clothes on him and led him away to crucify him. As they went out, they found a man of Cyrene, Simon by name. They compelled this man to carry his cross. And when they came to a place called Golgotha, which means place of a skull, they offered him wine to drink mixed with gall, but when he tasted it, he would not drink it. And when they had crucified him, they divided his garments among them by casting lots. And they sat down and kept watch over him there. And over his head they put the charge against him, which read, This is Jesus, King of the Jews. And two robbers were crucified with him, one on the right and one on the left. And those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads and saying, You who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself. If you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. So also the chief priests and the scribes and elders mocked him, saying, he saved others. He cannot save himself. He is the king of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross, and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God deliver him now if he desires him. For he said, I am the son of God. The robbers who were crucified with him also reviled him in the same way. Please bow with me for a word of prayer. O God in heaven, we pray for your blessing now. Having read the word of God and heard it, would you please strengthen your congregation? Would you please fill us with the spirit of God to the uttermost, that the word of God would be clear and practical and invoke in us praise and trust towards Christ. For those who are here today who do not know Christ, we pray that they would cast the guilt of their sin upon him this morning and find salvation in him. 
So would you sanctify your church and would you anoint the preaching and hearing of your word? In Christ's name, amen. Christ is in the middle of what we call Passion Week. And he has been tried by the Sanhedrin. You remember his trial at the hands of the Sanhedrin. And the Sanhedrin are the 71 top men in Israel. It's the Supreme Court of Israel or Judah, Judea. And they tried him wrongfully for blasphemy but, and got their wrongful conviction out of their sham trial, their show trial. And then from the Sanhedrin, they passed him on to Pilate because the Sanhedrin might have had the power to convict him of blasphemy, but they didn't have the power to execute him because they'd lost their ability to execute criminals when they were conquered by the Romans. And so they had to pass him off to a Roman court to have him executed. And so they passed him off to Pontius Pilate, who was the Roman governor of Judea, over the subjected people of Judea. And, and there they didn't try him for blasphemy, because they know that Pilate wouldn't really care about that. They tried him for treason against Rome. And again... Although Pilate found no guilt in him, he proved to be a wet noodle type of judge or politician, and he capitulated to the demands of the crowd and didn't really want to execute Jesus, but he offered the people the alternative of Barabbas, who really was convicted of treason. And to show their hypocrisy and to show that they didn't really care about treason, the people said, release Barabbas, but kill Jesus. And they demanded that Christ would be crucified, and so Pilate handed him over to be crucified. No one found fault in Jesus, no, not one, but they certainly had their allegations. And today is the text that follows. This is what unfolds after Pilate decides to capitulate to the satanic demands of the rage mob. This is the evil that follows, and it's basically waves of evil just pound up against our Christ. Over and over, the, the evil just beats against him, whereby everyone that is acting in this story, every actor, every one who commits an action verb, okay, the subject of an action verb is doing pure evil. There's no good in it. And today's text is that evil that follows, and we see it, it's divided up into four sections. We have the evil of the soldiers, the evil of the passerbys or the bypassers, the evil of the religious leaders, and the evil of the robbers who were crucified with Christ. And they all rage in madness, violent waves pounding against our Savior with violence, mocking, and blasphemy. And other than Jesus... The only one who marginally does good in the text is Simon of Cyrene, who carries the cross of Christ. But even Simon of Cyrene isn't the, the subject of an active verb. He is the recipient of Roman action. So the Romans actually had to force him to carry the cross to demonstrate the tyrants, the evil tyrants that they were as they grabbed this innocent man off the street and just forced him to carry the cross. Although it would have been an honor to carry the cross of Christ, we're not left knowing whether or not he considered it an honor at this particular point. And so he's the only one that does good other than Christ, but even then he is a passive actor, not an active actor, given the structure of the text. And here's the point of this, all of this. The point is to display the evil that Jesus subjected himself to. Even he is not an active actor in this text. He is the recipient of it. He's carried along in the text. I mean, he's voluntarily handed himself over, and God is sitting in the thrones, on the throne in heaven and orchestrating everything, even orchestrating these waves of evil somehow in a mysterious way whereby he's not responsible for it. But Jesus, Jesus, in one sense, is passively being carried along, being passed from person to person or crowd to crowd or group to group, 
where they commit all kinds of evils and indignities against him. He doesn't even act actively in this. He voluntarily handed himself over. So this tells us the evil that Jesus was subjected to voluntarily. And this tells us where sin leads. So as I pull back the curtain and show you the evil and the sin in our text this morning, it's a warning to you. This is where sin goes. And you look at this and you should stand in kind of ghastly horror over what occurs here. But you need to know this is where sin leads without the grace of God. This is where you go without the grace of God. It's where I go without the grace of God. This is where societies go. It's where churches go without the grace of God. And so people that do not have the restraining grace of God on their lives, this is where they end up. And so you can look at this and you should see yourself in this and cry out, oh God, have mercy on me. But by the grace of God, this is where I will go. The madness to which I will descend in my own sin if the Lord doesn't rescue me. And then in this text, you should see the love of Christ for you. He did all of this to atone for your sin. Every stroke across his back, every thorn into his brow, every nail into his hand, every shame and indignity he suffered on this dark day is a shame and indignity that you deserved, but that he took willingly for your sin. And so you look at this and you see in it the love of Christ. And some of you might be in church today wondering why we spend so much time talking about the cross or talking about Christ. And this is why. Because this is the hope of the world. It all goes back to this moment where Jesus Christ was crucified on behalf of sinners, where he suffered at the hands of wicked men and received the wrath of God that we deserved. So that when you look upon this Savior, you can trust him, and you do trust him, you receive full pardon for your sin. You don't need to experience the guilt and suffer the guilt of your sin. Why would you subject yourself to that when Christ has already subjected himself to it for you? He died in your place. And so this, as I noted, this is divided into four sections. The evil of the soldiers, the evil of the bypassers, the evil of the religious leaders, and the evil of the robbers. In all of that, we see our own evil. All of that, we see where sin leads and what it costs. In all of that, we see Christ's love for us. Now, prior to him handing, being handed over to the soldiers and the bypassers and the religious leaders and the robbers, we have this one last action of Pilate, which is worth noting in verse 26, which we looked at last time, but I want to elaborate a little bit more on it today. And this is the last action, and he's handed over to these people. Then he released for them Barabbas, and having scourged Jesus, delivered him to be crucified. So remember at this point, Pilate has now Jesus scourged and crucified. Remember at this point that Jesus has gone without sleep all night because this is daytime. And it wasn't an easy night because it was a night when he was betrayed in the garden by Judas to an angry mob in Gethsemane. And it wasn't an easy night because he suffered the false allegations of the Sanhedrin. In fact, he'd already been brutalized by the Sanhedrin where it says in verse 67 of 20, chapter 26, then they spit in his face and struck him and some also slapped him. Then they mocked him. This was an evening where he was taken through the streets to Pilate who then interrogated him. It was an evening where he was the turned into mourning and in the morning... He was condemned by the crowd. Could you imagine standing before a crowd of a thousand people, of thousands of thousands of people, all eyes are fixed on you, you've just been beaten, spit on, slapped around, mocked, falsely accused, 
betrayed by one of your closest, and thousands upon thousands of people are demanding that you be killed, and you know you're innocent. Could you imagine that? Well, this is, this is the last 24 hours in the life of Christ before we get to this point in verse 26 where He's handed over to be scourged. Verse 26, He's handed to be crucified, and before being crucified, Pilate has Him scourged. No sleep all night, betrayed in Gethsemane, false allegations, slapped around, spit on by the Sanhedrin, taken through the streets, presented to the crowds, subjected to the angry crowds who demand that he be killed by crucifixion, and now the scourging. Let me just describe the scourging before I move on to the description of what the evil soldiers do to him. The scourging entailed, there was a wooden handle on the instrument that they would use to scourge people, the whip, and coming from the wooden handle, there would be several cords attached to it, perhaps of leather, and worked into the cords would be sharp pieces of bone or brass. And so the Lord would have to probably bend over, and then on either side of Him would be a man. One man on His right, one man on His left, and they would take turns whipping Him over the back with those sharp whips, the scourging. And the scourging was so bad that it, it was very common Yes, it would rip open the flesh, but it was very common to be so brutal that you would actually, through the back, see the bodily organs on the inside of the body because the flesh wounds would be so deep. It, his back would have been flayed. So there would have been nothing left almost to his back after this violent laceration that likely, well, certainly left his muscles exposed but likely left perhaps his lungs and even intestines exposed through his back, okay? So this is the night that he's had. And, and then it just gets worse. There's no end to this, it seems, as you read the text. And in that condition, betrayed in Gethsemane, false allegations, slapped around, spit on by the Sanhedrin, taken through the streets, interrogated by Pilate, condemned by the crowds, and now scourged, in that condition, he's handed over to waves of evildoers that pound against him, and it starts with the soldiers. It starts with the soldiers. And this is the first wave of evil that pounds against Christ, the evil of the soldiers. And Pilate hands Christ over to this first wave that will carry him, in verse 27, it says, And the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the governor's headquarters, and they gathered the whole battalion before him. The governor's headquarters, I've talked about that before. That's the praetorium. The governor lived in Jerusalem. His official residence was in Caesarea by the sea, but he was in Jerusalem. He had an official Jerusalem residence because he'd be there for the feasts to calm down any uprisings. That's when the uprisings would be. So he's in the governor's Headquarters, and it says in our text here that the whole battalion, that the soldiers of the governors took Jesus into the governor's headquarters, and they gathered the whole battalion. And a battalion was a tenth of a Roman legion. So a Roman legion was about 6,000 people, so a battalion would have been about 600 men. And so here's Christ in the governor's headquarters, having had his back flayed, spat on, beaten, pushed around, falsely accused, an absolute night of terror, standing before 600 men. It's, there's no, just you read the text and it gets more horrible. And what do they do but humiliate him in front of 600 men? Verse 28, see what it says? And they stripped him in front of 600 men that are jeering and laughing at him to absolutely humiliate our Savior. And then it says, they put a scarlet robe on him to make him look like a king, to mock him. It could have been simply a scarlet sash or mantle, perhaps not a full robe, perhaps just a scarlet sash, Either way, the objective was to humiliate him, and the transfer of clothing off and then onto the back 
would have exasperated the open flesh wounds. They would have chafed against the open flesh wounds, and it didn't stop with the robe. Verse 29, it says, In twisting together a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and put a reed in his right hand. And kneeling before him, they mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. The crown of thorns was a wreath that they would have made out of a thorn bush or a vine of thorns, they wrapped it together, would have had deep thorns on it that would have pierced into his skull so that in the mocking of him, laughing at him as the king, making fun of him as the king, making sport of him, not only in their sadistic laughing and their mockery, but in inflicting humiliating pain into his skull, as if he's not experiencing enough pain at all by this time. They want to break the skin and release more blood, and with the robe that they put on him, mock him as king with the fake crown, the crown of thorns. Now, it's important that I just kind of pull back from this text at this moment and remind you why this is all happening from a theological and spiritual perspective. And the reason this is all happening from a theological and spiritual perspective is to undo the curse so that he bears the curse. And so what was one of the first curses that God gave the man but that the earth would produce thorns and thistles? And here Jesus is bearing the curse. And as John Trapp, the Puritan minister, said, Christ, by wearing the crown of thorns, the first fruit of the curse, took away the sin and curse of all his people. And so there is Jesus demonstrating the consequences of sins, you know, receiving the payment for sins, and displaying his full love for his people. He is like Adam and Eve when they were unclothed in the garden, suffers the humiliation of nakedness as Adam and Eve had to run behind the bush and have themselves covered in fig leaves because they were ashamed of their sinful nakedness. Here Jesus receives the shame of nakedness, and here Jesus, just as Adam had to bear the curse of the thorns, and all of his sons since have had to do, there Jesus bears the curse of the thorns right into his skull. This is the death of Christ, the dying of Christ for the sins of men because he loves us. There was a reed that was put in his right hand, we're told from our text there in verse 29. And that, of course, was to mock him as king with the royal scepter. So the fake crown, the fake robe, the fake scepter are all there. And there were coins with Caesar on them. Caesar was crowned and Caesar had his royal sash or mantle or gown on. And Caesar had his royal scepter and so they dressed Jesus up as a fake king because they knew that he'd just been tried as a traitor, as a pretend king, and they've now dressed him up as a fake king so to mock his royal claims. Have you ever had someone mock the claims of Christ? Oh, really, he's king? Then how come there's so much evil in the world? Oh, really, he's king? You really want to convince me that he's king in this scientific age? You think that's a really good idea to believe in miracles and a Christ that rose from the dead and people laugh and they mock and they jeer at him for his claims to kingship. This is the same sin, the same ugly sin that was rising up in the hearts of these soldiers as they vitriolically mock Christ and then get on their knees before him. 600 men. Hail, King of the Jews, they say in verse 29. They carried on with sadistic vitriol that can only be explained by declaring it is demonic-fueled madness. You could say, well, these men were sick. Well, I wouldn't say that they were mentally sick, but I would say that they were spiritually sick. 
And the spiritual sickness was the cause that affected the brain. And this is why growing men would act this way, because they had no knowledge of God that they believed in. And all their knowledge of God in Christ was turned into mockery as they hurled insults and sadistically and violently humiliated our Savior before 600 strapping soldiers. They carried on humiliating him. In verse 30, it says, And they spit on him and took the reed and struck him on the head, spitting on that perfect face that was as radiant as the sun on the Mount of Transfiguration. And here they are spitting on it, spitting on that perfect face that with tenderness and love looked upon the little children and said, let the little children come to me. Spitting on that perfect face that looked with mercy and kindness upon the demoniacs and upon the sick and the infirm and the blind and the deaf and healed them. Those empathetic eyes, those sympathetic eyes, they spit in them. By, and then beat him over the head with the scepter that they gave him. They took the reed out of his hand and they beat him. And the tense of the verb being an imperfect indicates that the beating was not one beating, but it was a continuous beating. This is a loud scene with loud, strong Roman soldiers beating him and beating him and beating him with the reed over his head, driving those thorns deeper into his skull with each sadistic beating. And this, by the way, represents... Most of us have grown up in a country where we have seen and we have believed that the military and the police have our best interest in mind. And we have been taught this as children... But this is what the military and the police descend into when they become Christless. And as we reflect upon today, one year ago, the convoy was in Ottawa and we saw the images of police officers and some of us, some among us, were there thrown on the ground and beaten by the police. One, at least one person trampled by a horse. This is the sadistic behavior that starts to come out in the human heart and in their actions when they reject Christ. And these are the people that enjoy beating innocent people and hurting innocent people because they are satanically inspired and they are Christless and they are sadistic. So finally... What they do in verse 31 is they redress him. They take the sash off of him or the mantle off of him and put his clothes back on and they send him off to be crucified, verse 31. And when they had mocked him, see they, the mocking continues, they stripped him of the robe and put on his own clothes and led him away to be crucified. The Roman soldiers could function as little tyrants. This was part of the Roman occupation of Israel. Because what the soldiers could do is they could grab a Jewish citizen, a Hebrew citizen, off the road and force them to do something. Force them to carry their bags, force them to carry their equipment. And, and in an instant, you could be going on your way down the street in Israel, in Jerusalem, and a Roman soldier could stop you and enlist you by forcing you to carry something or do some menial task for him. That's the way they operated. They operated as little tyrants. And these little tyrants, these evil soldiers, they enlist someone into their service in verse 32 with Simon of Cyrene. It says, as they went out, they found a man of Cyrene, Simon by name. And notice, or Simon of Cyrene does not, he's not the active actor in any of these verbs. He's the passive actor. He's forced to do something. What does it say? 
they compelled this man to carry his cross. So Simon doesn't voluntarily carry the cross. They compel him. Who are the main actors in this section? Well, Simon is acting. He's doing things. But it's all under the compulsion of the soldiers. So we're still in this section talking about the evil of the soldiers. And they enlist Simon of Cyrene. And Cyrene is located in modern-day Libya, 10 miles from the Mediterranean. And there were Jews in Cyrene, but there was also a synagogue composed of Cyrene Jews in Jerusalem. So maybe he was a resident of Jerusalem, or maybe he was visiting Jerusalem for the Passover from Cyrene. But it's not difficult to imagine that Jesus became exhausted after the evening that he had carrying the cross... And carrying the cross was such a reproach, Jesus bore our reproach, but it was such a reproach that nobody showed him enough sympathy to carry the cross. You've got to understand this, the shame that was associated with being crucified in the Roman world, to know why nobody would volunteer to carry this cross for him. In our society, we've lost, I think, in large swaths, a sense of shame. There's not a lot of behavior in our society that still bears shame. You know, we, we tolerate, we pride ourselves in tolerance, but really it's just tolerance of anything that's evil. And so there's very little shame. But, but in days gone by, there was shame associated with all kinds of behavior that you would consider to be repulsive. Not so much today. Perhaps the only criminal offense that might be equated or, I guess, criminal recognition that might be equated with this shame that would come with burying or, or carrying a cross would perhaps be the shame of having your name on maybe the sex offender registry. There, there's a shame associated with that that is unlike any other crime. And here, carrying a cross would bear that level of shame socially. And so if you saw someone carrying a cross down the street, you would say, there's no way I want to associate with that individual. There's no way I want to carry that cross or, or be seen with that person. Why is that? Because there's so much shame. And so the Roman soldiers enlisted Simon of Cyrene because we can imagine that Jesus was beginning to faint under the weight and they had to force Simon of Cyrene because nobody would dare volunteer to bear that level of reproach in that society. And so they took him outside the city to Golgotha in verse 33 and when they came to the place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull, you notice he's removed from society to be crucified. There's another shame. You're not good enough to be, to be crucified in the city. You're so rotten and bad, you've got to be crucified outside the city. And so they remove him outside the city to Golgotha. And Matthew translates it for us, which means the place of the skull. The Greek word is cranio. You can see where we get our English word cranium from. It's the place of the skull. Why? Because of all the skulls on the ground. So you have this picture of death that's being painted for you. Outside the city, shame, you know, open flesh wounds, and then this is the place where many have been executed and no care has been given to their bodies, so their bodies rot on the ground, and there are human skulls littered across the landscape. David Dixon commented on this, and he said, The sight of dead men's bones, formally executed as malefactors, and the scent of their rotten relics might offend both sight and smell. So by the way, when we sin, all of our senses participate in the sin. In fact, people sin because they like the way their senses feel when their nerve endings experience the sin, all their senses. That's why people sin. And so when Jesus goes to bear our sin, 
He goes to the place where all of his senses are bearing our sin. It's not just the pain that he receives on the cross. It's one thing to die in pain. But people can be comforted to a level when they die in pain if they die with their families around them, in their own bed, in the comfort of their own home. There's a level of comfort associated with that, even if they're dying in pain. But Jesus doesn't just die in pain, but he dies with rotting flesh and human skulls littered across the ground in front of him, outside of the community, away from the people. All his senses feel, smell, taste, and see sin. Everything in this moment. Why? Well, I'm trying to emphasize in this sermon why. Sin is very bad, and Jesus loves you very much. And that's how much he loves you, is this is the place he will go to die. And they offer him in verse 34 the opportunity to dull his senses. So we've had the senses described, so it makes sense they offer him this opportunity to dull his senses in verse 34. They offered him wine to drink mixed with gall, but when he tasted it, he would not drink it. Now, wine mixed with gall would have been considered a bitter narcotic that would have been used to alleviate pain. So you've, you've likely been sick or injured, and you have been put on painkillers. Maybe high doses, or maybe it's simply a low dose because you took a Tylenol and an aspirin, you had a headache. But this is a, this is an, this is a primitive attempt to numb the pain of the crucifixion, is what they offer him here. Wine mixed with gall, it was a, it was a narcotic. But look at what it says. They offered him wine to drink, mixed with gall, but when he tasted it, he would not drink it. R.C.H. Lenski commented, and he said, this is why he refused to take the wine with the gall. He intended to go through the final ordeal with a perfectly clear mind. He intended to endure all without avoiding a single agony. The verb here actually indicates the way the verb, the tense of the verb in the Greek, where it says they offered him the wine mixed with gall, the verb indicates that it wasn't a one-time offer. But as he was going to be crucified with his face all mangled up and completely humiliated and his back all ripped open and the night of terror that he's just survived, as he's walking to this place of the skull, the, the idea that you get from the verb in this text is that they're offering it him to him again and again. Won't you take this? It'll numb the pain. Won't you take this? This will help you. Well, won't you take this? This will, this will ease the experience. So the sense is that there are people along the way who keep offering him this narcotic to dull the senses and alleviate the pain. And the sense of the verb isn't just that they keep offering him the narcotic. The sense is, is that he keeps refusing the narcotic. So that even in his lowest moment, this gives you an idea of the focus of Christ as he went to the cross and the love that he has for his church, even in his lowest moment, he could not bring himself, because of his obedience to the Father and the mission that he was on, he could not bring himself to dull the sense of the pain because he wanted to bear the full pain for the full weight of our sins. He's focused. Our Lord is focused. Again and again, he was offered to have his senses dulled. Well, the gambrel... Gamble over his clothing in verse 35, the soldiers do, indicated that he was stripped naked again before he was hanged from the cross. In verse 35 tells us, and when they had crucified him, they divided his garments among them by casting lots, which fulfills the 22nd Psalm, verse 18, where it says, they divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots, and then they watch over him to ensure that no one rescues him. In verse 36, they sat down and kept watch over him, sitting there watching to make sure that he actually died. And perhaps 
even to rub it in the face of the Jews, Pilate's charge that the soldiers put over Jesus is ironic because it says, and over his head they put the charge against him, which read, this is Jesus, the king of the Jews, which indicates that he had no real crime. You see that? He was tried as the king of the Jews. He was hanged on the cross as the king of the Jews. And they put it over his head. They couldn't put it over his head that he was a traitor. They didn't put it over his head that he was a blasphemer. They put it over his head the truth. The truth that Matthew's been telling us all along. What, has been, what was the first point of Matthew in the genealogy in chapter 1? That Jesus is the son of who? David, the king of the Jews. And here in a twist of irony, Pilate sentences him, maybe just to rub it in the face of the Jews a little, that Jesus is the king of the Jews in verse 37. No real crime, but he dies with above his head the message of who he really is. And thus is the evil of the soldiers, the mocking and the shaming. That's the evil of the soldiers. Let's quickly look at the rest of the evil that unfolds in this passage. As we see the evil of the bystanders in verse 39, look at what it says. And those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads. The word derided there is translating the Greek word blasphemeo. So what it's meaning is they blasphemed him. It would have been a busy road, I guess, and maybe an intersection. The traditional site of the crucifixion is an intersection. And then wagging their heads, which is a sign of disgust and also comes from Psalm 22 verse 7. It says, all who see me mock me. They make mouths at me. They wag their heads. And as if he hasn't proven his design, divine sonship enough already in the gospel of Matthew, sounding like Satan in Matthew chapter 24, they demand of him in verse, or sorry, in Matthew 4, they demand of him in verse 40, you who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself. If you are the son of God, Come down from the cross. Now, I can't, pay attention to me for a minute. I, I can't imagine, I can't imagine the pain of crucifixion, and nor can you. Nor can I imagine the humiliation that he suffered and the scourging that he suffered and the pain of betrayal that he suffered. I can't imagine that. But what kind of heartless people would watch a man die on a cross in such a miserable way as he's hanging there shamed and dishonored from the cross and start laughing at him and mocking him. You see the, the human sin that's coming out here? The terror? Did, and, and by the way, these passerbys aren't mocking the men on either side of him. They're not mocking the robber on his left or the robber on his right. They're mocking him. And these are people that have no relation to him. It just says they're walking by, they're traveling. For whatever reason, they're going down this road on that day, maybe to visit family for the Passover. And they happen to see one man on the cross. There's three of them there, but one they're focused on, and that focus turns to mocking. The demonic madness on that day with random acts of blasphemy spewing out of them. The evil of the bypassers. And then with the evil of the bypassers, we have the evil of the soldiers already mentioned. And then finally, or thirdly, the evil of the religious leaders who join in, verse 41 through 42. So also the chief priests and the scribes and the elders mocked him, saying, He saved others. He cannot save himself. He is the king of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross, and we will believe in him. They mocked him, saying, the text says, which is a continual action again. So all of this stuff is continual over again, sounding again like the passerbys and sounding again like Satan in Matthew chapter 4. What do we have? We have the actions of the soldiers. We have the actions of the bypassers. We have the actions of the religious leaders. And all of this is just coming at Jesus like wave after wave after wave pounding against our perfect Christ. And then finally, we have the evil of the robbers who were crucified beside him. There were men crucified on either side of Christ. We see in verse 38, then two robbers were crucified with him, one on the right and one on the left. 
And with the soldiers, with the bypassers, with the religious leaders, they join in verse 44. And the robbers who were crucified with him also reviled him in the same way. Nobody reviles the robbers. This really ought to stand out to us. They revile Christ from the high and mighty religious leaders to the common foot soldiers to the people who are randomly passing by to the other men who were bearing the shame of the cross and themselves were suffering on those crosses in their last breath find energy to blaspheme Jesus Christ in this satanic chorus that breaks out against the Son of God. All the active verbs are carried out by evildoers against Jesus. Violence, mocking, blasphemy, and vitriol. All of it. All the active verbs in this very large portion of Scripture is all pointing towards hatred of Jesus. And by the way, this is where sin leads. Do you know that? Your sin's not innocent. This is where it goes. And you should be able to see in these your own sin. You yourself crying out from this crowd, if it were not for the grace of God, this is where you go into this miserable scene of death. And this is what sin looks like. Vile darkness in the place of the skull. And this is the life of, or the love of Christ who suffers for his people, for us. And so having described this scene of Christ's crucifixion, we should shudder at the thought of sin because the vile darkness that occurs at Calvary, Golgotha, the place of the skull, and we should stand in awe of the love of Christ for us. Why? Well, every stroke across his back, every shame that he experienced, every thorn into his brow, the nails into his hands, and the mocking of the men that looked upon him as he was humiliated before the crowds, all of it was for us. So we don't need to suffer that for our own sins. And so you should look at him in this text and be thankful. And some of you aren't Christians. You haven't put your faith in Christ yet. Today would be the perfect day, having described the scene of the crucifixion, today would be the perfect day to rest in Jesus, to, to really entrust your whole life to his message of salvation. This is a complete atonement. It's done. All of his sins, or all of your sins, have been paid for by the Son of God. Entrust yourself to Christ today. And put your faith in it. And some of you profess faith in Christ, and you continue to scourge yourself with the shame and the guilt of your own sins and your own past. Look to Jesus and spare yourself the pain. And be relieved of the misery that you're inflicting upon yourself. And some of you let other people continue to lash out against you. The devil himself, the accuser of the brethren. And this is where you take up the shield of faith and say, no, my sins were paid for on Calvary. No, my shame was nailed to the cross on Calvary. No, my death is done away with on Calvary. I no longer fear the hell that God created for the devil and his angels. I no longer listen to the guilt that Satan throws at me. And I no longer scourge my own soul. Why? Because Christ has paid it all. And so I love him. And I give him everything. And I worship him. And you trust him. And you marvel that such a kind Savior would die in your place on Calvary's cross amidst wicked men in such a dark and dirty place. Let me pray. Oh God in heaven, we thank you for Christ our Savior. And we thank you that he died on the cross. And we trust your mercy and your grace at this very moment. We receive the forgiveness of sins that he has procured for us.
And we look to Him for salvation, and we entrust ourselves to Him and find great peace in what He has done, the one who is worthy of all of our worship. And it's in His name that we pray. Amen.